I told you, you're not welcome here. You're not welcome anywhere. Hi, Peanut. I'm gonna need you to come with me right now. This summer, the Merc with a Mouth is back and his most creatively bankrupt adventure yet. Join Deadpool as he drags Hugh Jackman back out of retirement to play Wolverine one last time, destroying any sense of closure you felt after Logan, and finally understanding how comic book readers feel every time a character dies just to come back only a year later. Narrative tension? Never heard of her. Dead Wolverines don't make money. Follow the epic journey of Deadpool and Wolverine. As they journey across a setting, you need to have seen two seasons of the Loki Disney Plus show to understand, and experience guest appearances from all the most obscure Fox Marvel movies that will definitely age incredibly well and not look at all weird when they fade from public consciousness. Watch the movie that stars two queer main characters. The weirdo right-wingers online are calling a non-woke, non-DEI heterosexual superhero movie and try to figure out which slurs got deleted from their tweets' first drafts. Watch his terrible visual effects stun audiences, and the people that condemned bad visuals and excessive cameos in the She-Hulk TV show act like that's not a problem now, for reasons. Deadpool and Wolverine. Neither of the main characters are women, so it's okay to like it. Hi, I'm Bridget Empire. By day, I'm the science and culture correspondent for Hydra Sleeper Cell and British newspaper, The Daily Telegraph. But by night, I put these videos out when my editors aren't looking so that I can sneak left-wing messaging out through the back door. I get that's not very exciting as a superpower, but we can't all have healing factors or super strength. Some of us just take estrogen and play D&D instead of fighting crime, you know? Today, I'm talking about Deadpool and how capitalism inevitably makes art worse. You see, most of us artsy types get into creative fields because we enjoy the process and the final product. It's an outlet, a passion project, and something in which we can really express ourselves in a way that's both therapeutic and tangible to other people. When a creative medium is controlled entirely by the profit motive, the art produced under its direction is twisted, forced into forms that extract as much money as possible while paying as little as possible to its workers. And this is a recipe for something that was initially made with love and vision to lose its soul. Not my fucking problem. Is that what you said when your world went to shit? To become but a vessel with which to deliver the mouse yet another big fat stinking check. So let's talk about superheroes and superhero movies. And what the fuck is happening with the MCU? New mask, same task. Five years after Robert Downey Jr.'s iconic superhero Iron Man met his end in Avengers Endgame, the Oscar winner will don a different mask to play the ultimate bad guy, Doctor Doom, in the next two Avengers films. What can I tell you? I like playing complicated characters. There are now three Deadpool movies. The first one was a passion project driven forward by Ryan Reynolds and other creatives, despite the studio's lack of interest in the projects. The follow-ups were much less of an uphill struggle. Deadpool himself is a character created by Fabian Nicieza and Rob Liefeld as a New Mutants villain during the transition in which New Mutants, a coming-of-age story about a team of young mutants doing X-Men stuff and repeatedly getting scarred for life in increasingly traumatic ways. Anyway, it was morphing into X-Force, the extremely 90s comic book with a thousand muscles and pouches on every single character, and centering Cable, a grizzled old clone man, notably not a teen, at least at the time, and taking the spotlight away from the titular New Mutants that were honestly infinitely more interesting characters. Deadpool as a character is a fairly obvious ripoff of Deathstroke, the Teen Titans villain from DC, that people my age might know as Slade from the Teen Titans TV show. Slade Wilson, Wade Wilson, Deathstroke, Deadpool. It's actually amazing that Marvel didn't get sued for this, especially as he was brought in as a villain for their teenage superhero team. As a parody character though, Deadpool did bring a sense of twisted humour with him that quickly made him popular, 
And he's stood the test of time in a lot better than a lot of the other edgy 90s Marvel heroes that have since been relegated to Wikipedia deep dives and jokes at their expense. Like, Adam X, the extreme, a cool 90s guy with a radical costume, and the aesthetics of a rock star whose mutant power is to make your blood explode. Sorry, Adam, I guess in the end you were too extreme for the X-Men. After all. Dan put a guitar solo in there. Like Adam X, however, practically everybody loves Deadpool. A superhero comedy with a fourth wall breaking protagonist who uses satire to criticize the tropes of the genre while also telling a deeply personal story about overcoming trauma and trying to control a violent monster lurking inside that threatens to overtake one's kind hearted, if crude nature. A monster with a heart of gold and a self awareness so powerful it destroys the very constraints of the medium it's in. Doesn't that describe two different Marvel heroes? One of which is almost universally beloved, and the other one actually came first, and is received very differently, at least in its on-screen form. Well... The first movie made more money than the guy who invented pants. It's often said that Marvel movies all end the same way. Wait, who's saying that? Because as you know, this show has nothing more than a feminist agenda that is meant to disrespect men. That's what... Puny woman. What's going on, everyone? Jeremy here from The Quartering, and uh, there is no set. There I suppose if I was some young, like, slay queen or some 30-year-old, 40-year-old wine mom, I think that they were hilarious. In particular, I think this show is written by women, for women, who have victimhood complexes. So let's continue to just pretend that it's just a bunch of angry men that are upset with this show or that don't like it, because that always works out perfectly well. Hello, Charlie's Angels. Great job on that film. But they just go out of their way to hire someone who says her job is to make men feel uncomfortable. The weird thing is that if you've been reading Marvel comics for as long as I have, you'll know that She-Hulk was really the pioneer for this. Deadpool has since become more popular, and if I'm being honest with myself, I was buying Deadpool comics a decade before I started buying any She-Hulk comics, but you can't take away the fact that these two characters, however different they are in many aspects, took inspiration from each other, and together cemented the formula for the Marvel superhero comedy that Deadpool is now basically synonymous with. I am, unfortunately for anyone that's going to call me a fake fan for making this video, one of those people who can honestly and incredibly pretentiously say that I liked Deadpool before it was cool. And by that I mean a decade before any of the movies came out. Anyone who's also into comics was probably just as much of a stan as I was at the time. I'd been collecting Ultimate Spider-Man since I was 11 years old. And when I was old enough to go to the shops on my own, I started spending my pocket money, which is what we on Turf Island call our allowance, on Cable and Deadpool, the legendary Fabian Nicieza comics that were essentially a superhero buddy cop comedy, with a homoerotic will they won't they play for last, but also definitely still there at its center. And I was obsessed. I've dropped in and out since, reading back issues, getting graphic novel collections, and if I'm remembering right, I think I read all of the Way Run, about half of the Duggan Run, and a couple of issues of the Thompson Run, but by the time those last two came out, I was deep into my X-Men obsession. And you only have so much money and time in the day, comics are fucking expensive. And frankly, any money that wasn't going on X-Men was going on Jason Aaron's Thor Run. If you know, you know. I've read She-Hulk too, though the only run I have strong memories of is Slot's Run, which I love, but I was just the right age for Deadpool when I found it. Now, I was one of these people that was really, really excited for X-Men Origins because he was going to be in it. <sighs> that, that, that didn't end well, did it? Look at the mess of my boy. And so when the actual Deadpool movie came out, I was gobsmacked because after all this shit, they actually got Deadpool right, even after the way they completely butchered him in X-Men Origins. And here is where the problems really start. Because the reason Deadpool worked is precisely the same reasons the reviews for this new one are a little bit more mixed, and the reason that people actually had a problem with the new She-Hulk TV show, beyond just blatant sexism. Deadpool, the first one, was a passion project. The studio didn't want it to happen, and it succeeded because people cared, and pushed for it. Modern Marvel movies work in the exact opposite direction. Franchise potential bums in seats and cameos to try and sell other movies and bank on nostalgia are all prioritized a million times more than any actual creative vision. Which is a shame, because if you can look beyond the outrage content and the horrific working conditions which resulted in its questionable CGI, in my opinion, as an OG Deadpool fan, 
The She-Hulk TV show is just as funny, just as good, just as true to the spirit of the comics as the Deadpool movies. But it did have problems, and a lot of those problems are shared with the new Deadpool movie. In fact, these are problems that you can find all throughout the recent slate of MCU movies. Deadpool's time in the spotlight again started as a passion project. On July the 27th, 2014, myself and thousands of other Deadpool fans woke up to leaked footage from a Deadpool movie. Like an actual Deadpool movie. Like many others, I didn't believe it was real. I thought it was a really convincing fan film. But it was real. And when Fox saw how much excitement that test footage was causing, over a year after this footage was filmed apparently, and long after deciding to shelve this project, the film that would become the first Deadpool movie finally got the green light. From what we now know, a decade later, the footage was intentionally leaked by creators involved in the project, as Ryan Reynolds himself put it in a recent interview, in which he was hooked up to one of those bullshit lie detector tests that don't do anything, and being interviewed by Hugh Jackman. Huh. That sounds like a Deadpool scene in and of itself. Anyway, were you behind the leak? Hugh Jackman asked. Great question. This is a great question. Pass. Reynolds replied. After some chuckling, and in order to answer the question from the lie detector administrator, Reynolds added, somewhat reluctantly, and I would say carefully, I might have provided an assist. I was just Scotty Pippen. I was there doing my job. Someone else gets all the credit. In contrast, the newest movie is chock full of bad visuals, a million cameos, and ties into the larger MCU storyline, something that the previous Deadpool movies cleverly avoided. Telling standalone movies that didn't try and set up ongoing X-Men storylines, aside from telling a few jokes at their expense. That doesn't mean it's not going to do well, and I've heard a lot of good things from people whose opinions I respect on it. Hell, I've liked all the Deadpool movies for all their faults. And She-Hulk, which Anne Chuds will probably hate me for saying this, is spiritually a very similar tone and concept. And I don't hate a lot of movies. I find a lot boring, sure, but I rarely hate them. When Ryan Reynolds helped out the people who made those leaks of the original Deadpool footage to get their passion project made, I don't know if they ever pictured that they would have to be stuck in the sandbox of a set from the Loki TV show, making cameo after cameo to bank on audience nostalgia, and ultimately be put under pressure to alter their vision to fit the whims and needs of a completely separate franchise. A lot of my issues with the MCU, and big budget movies in general, do I think come down to interference from above. Producers, marketers, and executives sometimes do way too much to shape a creative vision into a product to sell. But these movies, I suspect, would last the test of time better if they were allowed to be less of a product and just be art. Rather than being changed and warped by your Kevin Feige's and your Ike Perlmutter's and your god knows who else. Into a perfect little wad of cash for Mickey Mouse's big fucking mouth. Less a movie than a vessel with which to funnel money from the public into the pockets of shareholders and CEOs. I do think though that even with the entire package coming together into something that works, it's starting to exhibit some of the same symptoms of the problems that were actually real issues with, say, She-Hulk, which are ultimately problems with the MCU as a franchise in its totality, and ultimately the fate of any long-running piece of art when its primary purpose is not to be good art, but to make as much money as possible. We've seen several times in the MCU how creativity has been hampered by decisions from above, to the point where big directors have distanced themselves from their projects or quit altogether. Think Edgar Wright with Ant-Man, or how Sam Raimi got onto Doctor Strange 2. Actually, speaking of Doctor Strange 2, it's actually a perfect example of what I'm trying to get at here. We go on red? <laughs> Rule number one of multiversal travel, you don't know anything. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness started out as a project helmed by the previous Doctor Strange movie's director, Scott Derrickson, but the studio executives, and Derrickson named Feige directly here, were getting in the way. And the two, Derrickson and Feige, were becoming antagonistic. Scott Derrickson mentioned it was real creative differences that led to the separation between the director and Marvel Studios' head Kevin Feige. He said that it was just increasingly obvious that we were pulling against each other. He mentioned that Feige wanted to make a different movie than the one Derrickson imagined. He said this difference can create a monstrosity, and that's why he had to bounce. The final movie was directed by Sam Raimi, who you might remember from the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies, and a million cult horror movies. While this might inspire confidence without the context, Raimi was brought in very late to the game. The screenwriters were initially given three weeks start to finish to make a new script, and Raimi only had a few months to start production. As you might imagine, he was, and I'm quoting him here, rushed and panicked. Luckily, the pandemic, oh, that's a terrible sequence of words. 
Luckily, the pandemic meant that the MCU slate got switched around, and the entire team were given time to actually breathe, and not run headfirst into a migraine. Still, the final product had issues. Some of the visual effects were hard to look at, something that was also a problem in Thor Love and Thunder and She-Hulk, and we'll get to why that was. The movie had to set up a bunch of multiverse lore, and as such was littered with easter eggs and cameos that honestly felt cheesy and took away from the main themes and plot of the movie. Professor X turning up for three seconds as the X-Men 90s cartoon played was a completely unnecessary fan thing that just felt cynical, especially when Patrick Stewart had already had a perfect ending to his story in the movie Logan, and him coming back for this when he clearly didn't want to be there, only for him to then be offed minutes later just felt cheap entirely there for the nostalgia, and I went from being stoked as fuck at seeing the Illuminati on screen to just feeling… empty. This could have been played for last if this was a Deadpool movie, but this was supposed to be 100% serious. All the time spent on these cameos, on trying to set up future movies, could and should have been spent with the antagonist of the movie, Wanda. Showing how the evil MacGuffin book she got at the end of WandaVision was affecting her, allowing us to truly know what she was going through and why she was acting so differently to how we remember. The movie had a lot of potential, but in my eyes it was, in the end, aggressively mid. But if you ask the right-wing outrage channels what the problem with this movie was, they'd give you an entirely different answer. And that answer often would be... America Chavez. Now I take issues with the portrayal of America Chavez in this movie, but not for the same reasons these weirdos do. She was cast young, which is fine, they wanted to appear in more movies, but despite being one of the young Avengers, she was never that young in her early appearances, and thus we could explore more of her status as one of Marvel's few out and proud lesbians, something she was very upfront with in the comics from the very start, and something that is just absent from this movie. What's more, America Chavez in the comics is powerful and confident, but because of the role she plays in this movie, she is played like most teenage girls thrust into a life or death situation would be. She's scared but she is out of character. And because this isn't her story, because this is a Doctor Strange movie she's in so she can be set up for later, she has to be secondary to Doctor Strange here. So in some ways she is America Chavez, but more often than not she is barely a character, let alone the character I love from the comics, and is instead sort of a MacGuffin. She exists to make the plot move forward, and when the movie is at its most cliché, she becomes a sort of damsel to be saved, which is very unlike her comic appearances albeit with much more ability to fight back than your average damsel. And her being so prominent in this does sort of fuck the movie up a little bit, because it doesn't have the time to develop her like you need, and it definitely doesn't have the time to develop Wanda and Strange enough to make the whole film feel satisfying. This movie struggles to juggle three characters, which shouldn't be an issue, but it is. And it just feels like it would have been better to either make an America Chavez movie or a Doctor Strange movie, or to make this a series. Either way, this is not the reason most people who are mad with this movie were mad with this movie. Hell, I'm not mad at it. I enjoyed it enough, mid as it was. But those are some of my criticisms. Some people might take issue with them, that's okay. But as sus as my opinions might be to some people, they are at least problems I had with how I saw the movie, rather than the complaints the right-wing outrage fans were cooking up. America Chavez's ethnic background and sexuality were massively played down in this movie, to the point where the latter wasn't really acknowledged at all. And yet, because this movie featured a brown woman who is a lesbian in the comics, the right were livid. This is a movie with a white man's name on it, and now there's a woman? An ethnic minority? An LGBT? People were throwing out DEI around so much that it became clear quickly to everyone who caught a glimpse of their bigotry disguised as criticism that they'd just written racial slurs in their scripts and used the find and replace function to make them all DEI. We know you do it. Why don't you just be honest? Just tell us you don't have legitimate criticisms beyond every movie not being a sausage fest at a clan rally. Is that what you want? White hoods, white willies, muscular white men, oiled up, not a woman or brown person in sight. Is that what you want, Jeremy? I know you're watching, Jeremy. Is that what you want? Let me see your internet history, Jeremy. But the problems with Doctor Strange, whether the effects being lacklustre, the script feeling bloated and somehow rushed at the same time, the lack of well fleshed out characters because we're all supposed to have watched a million movies and TV shows first, America Chavez coming in to set up future movies, Wanda being in here to finish a plotline from previous shows, it all comes down to capitalism. This product is designed to make you buy more products, hence the cameos, the tie-ins, the setups for future movies and the callbacks to previous ones, so you have to buy Disney Plus to see what the fuck was up with Wanda, and the visual effects, well that's capitalism too, because Marvel has been treating their visual effects workers like actual shit, 
making them work ridiculous hours for very little pay. This was one of the real problems with She-Hulk I was talking about earlier, and it's present in Doctor Strange 2 and of course the new Deadpool movie. But when She-Hulk came out, it was a huge talking point. Not long before She-Hulk's release, I saw a video of Taika Waititi and I think Tessa Thompson laughing at how bad the visual effects were in Thor Love and Thunder. Does that look real? In that particular shot, no, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really, right? When you look close. You need to be more blue. Well, well you know, no. but does he look real? No, none of does us. She, look she, she looks, something looks very off about this. Waititi directed that movie. He could have spoken up, but he didn't. She Hulk star Tatiana Maslany, however, did. And she's the one receiving hate? Her speaking up on this might actually do something to make Marvel cut a few less corners. I mean, it probably won't, but it might. But she's a woman, so she's bad. She's a DEI. Well, whatever slur the weird She-Hulk Crusaders were trying to make at Maslany when they called her a DEI hire, she spoke up, along with the head writer of the She-Hulk series, Jessica Gao. The people panned by supposed fans of Marvel actually stood up for the people that people like Waititi, Kevin Feige, etc. have been allowing to be rushed, overworked, and ridiculed for the work they've managed to do under shitty conditions. Even if you hated the She-Hulk TV show, that's got to stand for something. And that will do more to fight the degradation of good art in this profit-hungry franchise than any of these outraged YouTubers who scream like a toddler pissing themselves in public when a movie comes out without a white male lead. I feel incredibly, like, deferential to how talented these artists are, and how quickly they have to work. Obviously, like, much quicker than probably should be given to them, in terms of, like, churning these things out. Miscellany told reporters during a virtual panel for the upcoming Disney Plus series at the Television Critics Association Summer Press Tour Wednesday. Jessica Gao, who is head writer on the series, added, It's terrible that a lot of artists feel rushed and feel that the workload is too massive. I mean, I think everybody on this panel stands in solidarity with all workers and is very pro-good working conditions. She-Hulk director Kat Koiro noticed that while she's worked with VFX artists on the show, we're not behind the scenes on these long nights and days. If they're feeling pressure, we stand with them and we listen to them, Koiro added. Maslani, Gao, and Koiro have been asked by a journalist about their experiences with the She-Hulk VFX artists and how you feel about the finished product, noting that there have been numerous accounts lately that VFX houses, they are feeling incredibly crushed by the studios in general, and Marvel keeps getting called out. Criticism specifically of Marvel Studios has been bubbling on the internet over the past few months, starting with anonymous posts on Reddit alleging the overwhelming last-minute changes and poor pay for overtime. One artist, Drew Govill, posted to Twitter in July, the working on Marvel shows is what pushed me to leave the VFX industry alleging that Marvel is a horrible client, and that his witness colleagues break down after being overworked, while Marvel tightens the purse strings. During the TCA panel, Maslany defended the visual effects on the show. I do think we have to like be super conscious of how the work conditions aren't always optimal, and that they've made these amazing strides in this industry, the actor said. I watch it and it doesn't look like a cutscene from a video game. I can see the characters' thoughts. I feel very in awe of what they do. And beyond the VFX and the cameos, we have the return of actors and characters whose stories were finished. Satisfyingly finished. Just to eke out a few bucks for the people who are wondering how they're possibly going to be used again. Patrick Stewart in Doctor Strange 2. Hugh Jackman, although this was apparently done much better, coming back as an alternate universe Wolverine in Deadpool and Wolverine. And just announced... <sighs> Robert Downey Jr. coming back as Doctor Doom. The fourth, I think, Romani character to be played by a white person and their heritage denied in this franchise? After Endgame for RDJ, that should have been it. But the mouse hungers for money. And so every satisfying decision must, must be undercut. People turn to sexism to explain their very real disappointment in the continued degradation of art under capitalism. They can feel something is wrong, but they don't know what it is. If someone tells them a piece of art is bad, not because it's being twisted into less art and more product, and instead because a woman or a brown person was in it, they don't necessarily know enough to know that that's bullshit. Something is clearly wrong. Woman was there, therefore woman bad. But it's obviously nonsense if you thought about these things for more than five seconds. Robert Downey Jr. coming back feels bad because it undercuts his character arc. It cheapens his ending in Endgame. And this, ironically, is something that follows exactly the trajectory of the comics. Death in comics is never permanent, because more stories need to be made, and a good piece of intellectual property cannot be allowed to remain a part of the past. It must be brought back, where it can continue to make money, where it can bolster the brand. What is profitable can never die. 
And these instincts that led to death in comics becoming something with no stakes, something readers are more likely to roll their eyes at now than actually be moved by, are the same instincts that are bringing back actors whose stories were finished long ago. Wolverine makes money. Robert Downey Jr. makes money. When your goal is profit, story doesn't matter. Audience experiences don't matter. Character arcs don't matter. Integrity of your creative vision doesn't matter. All that matters is the number of dollars you make for the mouse year after year. And that number must always, always go up. And unless my numbers go up, enough for me to avoid making a video for a couple of weeks to make a higher quality one, I'll be back next week <laughs> with a different video. Thanks for watching. the end if you liked it why not leave a like leave a comment subscribe and tell your friends about it share it around i'm unfortunately quite poor as always so if you have a few coins putting a hole in your pocket and you hate to see a trend like me down on luck why not help me get out of my massive horrifying overdraft and send me some money you can give me one-time donations on coffee or paypal links below as always or better yet sign up to my patreon or youtube memberships where you get early videos access to the members only discord my nintendo switch friend code and exclusive content Content, such as long form interviews with the Prince of the Weeks, Rosencroix, and Jesse Gender. Also, I'm doing this DD stream with uh, Sinan Cozy off of YouTube and all that stuff and Twitch. Uh, John the Junkin, who you might have know, you might know, Alastair from Praxis Cast, and our good friend John N. And that's cool. Um, you can check that over on Sinan's channel. And also, I'll start streaming soon, probably, although my internet's terrible. So we'll do a couple of tests first. But uh, I'll leave a link down here if that's started by now. I'll make a little second channel for it. So don't worry if you hate streaming. You won't have to see it here. I'll put in a little different thing, and I'll leave a little community note so you can all see it. Is that what they're called? Community notes? I think that's a different thing. Anyway, if you sign up for the YouTube member or Patreon, you will get your name right out at the end of each video, just like these lovely people. Martha and Orr, Tamsin, Bob the Builder, 544-5554. Isha, Nadine Della, Deborah Laboon, Vagish, Zilla Zathanium, Vince Whitaker, Amelia Unchained, Sarah Rudston, Jason Haig, Frank McManus, Susan Foster, Helena, Sierra Whiskey, <laughs> that's, sorry, Sierra Whiskey, Arestria, Ali Catgirl, John N, Scully, Jan, Lloyd Luciente, Jason Cribbett, Shield Vaden, Robin Podolsky, Turtle Choom, Casual Observer, Terry Roberts, Manta Ray, Courtney Burmack, Sleepy Slug, Philip Tabrogger, Soma Piglet, Brain Douche, Artie Wolf, Greg Noble, Deanna McMillan, Caroline Regalado, Alexandra Lilly, Howard Lott, Naranea, Scarjan, and Joey Cobalt. Thank you so much, and see you next time! Two bros chilling in the hot tub, five feet apart cause they're not 